Welcome back to another installment of Questions with Father on the SSPX podcast. In vitro fertilization, or IVF, has been front and center in the news following the Alabama Supreme Court's ruling that embryos created through IVF are legally children for the purposes of that state's wrongful death of a minor act. In the wake of the decision, politicians, religious leaders, and laypeople who view themselves as pro-life have wrestled publicly with legal and practical questions surrounding IVF, including its availability. Catholics, for their part, know, or ought to know, that the Church opposes IVF, although many remain unsure as to why. If IVF assists couples in having children, is this not a good thing? What crucial moral issues does IVF raise, and how should Catholics address them? In this timely episode, Father Ian Palco explains the mechanics of IVF while situating the procedure in a classical Catholic moral framework. He also stresses the importance of not separating procreation from its proper marital context. Now, here's Father Palco. Father Palco, thank you very much for joining us today to discuss a controversial question, um, at least from the perspective of the media and in the minds of many Catholics today. Um, IVF has been in the news. It has. So we're going to take advantage of that to discuss the Catholic principles on this question and um, some of the other moral principles that surround the question. But by way of introduction, since you also, you recently did a podcast for us on the broader questions of the natural law and morality. So um, to situate this particular discussion, IVF, in, in the broader uh, perspective of Catholic principles. Can you give us a summary, and um, and we'll go from there. Some of the details. Sure. So I, there was this um, as we were preparing this, we did a little yeah. uh, a little uh, sort of featurette, I guess, sure. set up yes. for this, and we were talking about a thirty thousand foot view. Yep. Um, I, and in there, I, hopefully, we gave some basic principles and a basic answer to the question that there's a there's an issue with the morality of IVF. But if we want to back up a little bit to understand why that's the case, we have to start from a principled uh, point of view. And we want Catholic principles or principles from the natural law. Um, the Back in the apologetic series, we were talking about the idea of the natural law and the idea of the Catholic morality coming from this, this notion of finality, meaning an end. It, things have ends, what they, they tend towards, and then we'll have means to get there. And whether we can get there or not, and we're using what means, that's where morality starts. That's looking at what we call the moral object of something, right? What that tends towards, and then we have circumstances, and then we have an inten the intentions of the person who's acting. Okay. That's the, that's the way we want to approach things here. And that has to be applied to this whole question in a proper order. If we're not principled about it, we're just going to make decisions from emotion. We're going to make decisions from just whatever seems politically prudent at the time, not from solid, solid good Catholic principles. Sure. That is, uh, that's all very helpful. And let's just jump in. <laughs> what are some of the moral principles that we have to have absolutely clear before we get into the particular topic of of IVF. So, um, yeah, so the, some of the overarching sort of traditional moral principles, um, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to the idea of children, mm -hmm. marriage is for children. And we're going to come into this idea too. Where, what does marriage allow? Marriage allows the means to children. That's what the whole contract of matrimony is for, for actions which tend towards procreation. And so it's going to create this union between man and wife that then set themselves up for procreation and through um, these means that God has established. Not that there is a necessarily a right to the fruit of that union, but that there is this right to use the means for the fruit. That's what we mean by an end, and then the means are set up for that end to be correctly morally achieved. So we need to have that first, otherwise we start to think, well, children are good, why don't we have more children? Right, and I think you see this argument, or you see the misunderstanding of the principles in the popular uh, version of this argument. For instance, everybody, enemy or friend, knows the church is pro-life, mm -hmm. which is one of those terms which is used equivocally. And so it's very easy for someone to say, okay, well, the church is pro-life. 
in vitro fertilization seems to be a way to um, reach the end of life. Produce more life. Ergo, yeah. this should be something a Catholic should support. The church should support it. One of the first interviews that was given after this was the governor of Texas. Um, I go down there on the weekends and take care of uh, our missions in the Fort Worth area. Um, and he came out and he's just talking about how, you know, uh, well, it's all about babies. You know, babies are a good thing and we should have more babies. And it, it's and whenever he was pressed on the issue, it was a lot of non-response and as to, you know, do you think that this embryo is the child? Well, we, we want babies and no, that's not the most important. It's this hedging of bets. There was another congresswoman who... Um, she holds herself out as pro-life. She actually was a co-sponsor. I think um, Nancy Mace. Okay. Um, she was a co-sponsor in a bill in Congress to define life as beginning at conception. But then this decision comes out and says, well, "No, I'm opposed to any any restrictions on IVF," um, it, because you you see this, and because there's not a whole lot of good moral modern principles mm -hmm. it seems like the absolute freedom the absolute liberty and then add on top of that this whole we like babies we like families we like life and that's good um, you see a divide between we could say pro-life groups over principles they really don't agree with on, on on the back end same conclusion that they come to at least on the question let's say of abortion but on other issues that aren't so clearly defined it's this equivocation as you said it's it's i see there's not there's not this analogical thinking there's not this systematic thinking there's not this principled thinking from means to end so this is really a critical question it's indeed we have to get straight oh, indeed or i yeah. suppose you could say you see it on the other side of the spectrum or the other way around too so you're against abortion and contraception can help reduce the number of abortions therefore you should be in favor of that means if the end is to have fewer abortions yeah. very common protestant argument because remember back since at least the 1930s um the most of the protestant churches have not opposed abortion in fact they've been in favor of it and the catholic church i mean you have humana vitae but you also go back to casti canubi yes and you go back even further the the consistent moral principles that the church has outlined um Maybe in Humana Vitae, we're a bit more personalist in that. Uh, that's that's a different question entirely. We might get there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, the, um, the Catholic principles have been really clear about what the end of marriage is, what the marital act is for. As a result of that, what means are legitimate, what actually impedes that natural end. And as in, right, in impeding or frustrating that natural end, then what's moral, what's not. IVS then seems to produce the end but it doesn't use the means. We're getting an end without the proper means being used. And, and that's, that's the core of the problem here. There's a okay. lot of other moral issues. Again, in that little short uh, clip that we, we put out before, we were saying it's a complicated issue. Yes. That's because there are a lot of moral problems along the way, but one of the first ones ends up being is this division of means and end. We're using different means, means that are completely artificial, outside of a woman's body to produce a child. And then we're trying to then go back into the natural process after the fact. It's, it's disturbing the natural order of things. Okay, and we're going to see that's not a detail. No, right? that's, so, that's, that's a feature. <laughs> right. Um, so why don't we talk or go into the specifics about mm -hmm. what IVF is sure. and how it happens. We'll go back then once you mm -hmm. give us a little bit of insight into what we're actually talking about and then apply some of those mm -hmm. moral principles or evaluate this yeah. this thing. I think that's important too because unless we understand a little bit about the detail of it, it seems like we're just being harsh. We're just coming out yeah. with this ar ar arbitrary decision. Right. The Catholic Church is just, you know, Again, we fall back on the baby's argument or something like that. Sure. Or an emotional argument. You don't want me to have a child. We don't want, you know, it, it's a tough issue to, to deal with people who are suffering from infertility, but we have to deal with it in a principal manner. And we need to know what IVF is first and how it works a little bit to understand where the principles apply. So, yeah. And in light of that, let's, let's dive right in. Um, yeah, Father, tell, tell us how IVF works. What is, what is the science behind it? Because this will help, uh, help us get some clarity on, mm -hmm. on how to evaluate it. So IVF, in vitro fertilization, um, 
we could go etymologically. That's always okay. a fun thing to do when you know uh, teaching let's, background let's here. Let's it. let's let's take the the word apart, <laughs> stretch it apart, etc. Et um, so in vitro literally means in glass from the Latin. Um, and that's from the fact that a lot of these biological experiments that were done early along are done in lab glass, right? They're take, it's things that are taken outside of a living animal, cells that are grown, for instance, in a Petri dish or, or in some kind of chemical solution. They're done mostly in glass, very nice, neutral, neutral mm. medium to do that in. Um, and because this was originally done that way, chemical, biological processes, any biological work nowadays that's done outside of the body is usually called in vitro. Okay. In vivo, in the living or in the living thing, that's when you do work inside the body, for instance. Okay, Most biological work is probably going to happen in vitro. So that, that's the idea of place here. Got it. But now we have the second part, fertilization. Fertilization is, I mean, exactly what it sounds like. We're taking um, a sperm, we're taking an egg, we're putting them together, we're uniting them to create an embryo, a living human being um, in glassware or in whatever, you know, plastic, whatever, whatever medium they're using that in and growing it at least for a little while outside of the body. So it's, when we talk about IVF along those lines, we're talking about this conception or manufacture of a child outside and then we're also talking about another procedure too that they tend to go together we have ivf in vitro fertilization done outside the body but now we need the child to be able to be gestated so it's now put into a mother's womb that could be the mother uh, who produced the egg that was fertilized mm. it might be someone else a surrogate or the commonly um, appreciated term now is gestational carrier okay okay yeah, so we have two different procedures and we we have a morality for each of them but overall we're going to show that it's it ne neither one is morally acceptable okay both the surrogacy or even the implantation but also the in vitro fertilization to begin with but these are two procedures that kind of go together so already we see that we have something going on that's outside the normal order mm -hmm. of things yeah and uh, as i said before that's the feature of it okay Oftentimes this is done simply, at least in the majority of cases it's done, where the couple can't conceive or has not been able to conceive naturally. So there, there's a treatment out there. If you look at the CDC statistics on this, um, back in a report from 2021, 20, uh, but it's similar in previous years, there's a 2016 report as well. Um, at least, um, I want to say it's at least, I could probably look up the statistic here, 59%, um, I think it is, of, um, of these procedures are done for um, reasons that are uh, due to a fertility issue, a lack of ability okay. to conceive. That does, that's not all of them. 41% are going to be done, in fact, for egg banking or embryo banking, just saving these children conceived for a little bit later. Okay. Already we're Making starting a deliberate choice, deliberate choice to sort of okay. save a few kids for after the Wall Street career is done. Got it. We're already seeing that maybe there's something disordered here. Um, but in those cases where it's used for those who aren't fertile, you're trying to take and it could be for the uh, infertility on the basis of the husband or the man or the wife, the, the woman here. Mm -hmm. um, you're taking usually in. The main procedure is called intracytoplasmic sperm injection. You take a single cell from the man, you take the egg from the woman, you put the single cell into the, into the egg, and if fertilization happens, if, then you have a conceived embryo there, an oocyte, as okay. the term is. Um, that's actually a fairly recent practice, though I guess maybe I'm dating myself now, that's 92. <laughs> <laughs> I, very, I, very recent. I, I was well, yeah. At ni in ninety two, I was still I was still in middle school. This so. is a traditional Catholic yeah. podcast. We're taking the long view. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. Although the IVF itself, the first the first human being conceived using IVF is in the late nineteen seventies. Wow. So it's it's not as if this procedure is hundreds of years old. It's um, it's relatively recent, medically speaking. the The main way we we main procedures we're using for it are the last what, 30 years or so now? Um, mm. 
and it's IVF ends up now being this gold standard, as they call it in medical procedure. This is the the go to okay. thing, okay, um, for male infertility. One reason because it it helps to control this aspect of thing, which I think if not mistaken is twenty eight percent of cases of okay. IVF are for male infertility. Um, you don't have to extract. So if a if a man is able to produce a a um, a normal, if he's not infertile himself, so oftentimes the manner of a manner of extracting the sperm is going to be a sinful manner. But if he's infertile, or in a certain other cases, it's going to be through more or less aspirating. You're going to draw out um, from the uh, from the uh, man's uh, reproductive organs. You're going to draw out um, a sperm or a series of them to then. Put in, so it doesn't necessarily require a a sinful act uh, okay. of of self abuse in all cases. But if the man is not infertile, that's actually still done in a lot of these cases. Okay, you're starting out from a bad standpoint there, yeah. but not necessarily in certain cases. Okay, after all of this is done, you're going to produce a number of embryos in most cases because human beings are not machines. Not everything always works real well. About 27% of the time, a couple who uses IVF, on average, again, CDC statistics here, um, is able to conceive from a single cycle mm. of this. So it's, it's a fairly low rate. Some clinics will advertise much higher, selective choosing, but CDC itself says it's in the 25 to 30% range, which is not, not all that high. Yeah. So, then you have to take these embryos that you've created, you have to place them into the woman's womb or the gestational carrier. Um, so in this case, you have sometimes surrogacy, right? Um, or you have posthumous parentage, right? Uh, there was a somewhat um, infamous case of a funeral, I believe it was in St. Patrick's Cathedral, where a little, um, um, what do you say? A, a woman, uh, uh, the widow of this man, uh, announced that she was pregnant with with by by him after the, his death because okay. there had been these preservation of, of of things. So, okay, it even touches Catholic circles here. We're not just talking about outside of our circles. It's it, it's an issue that even flows into to Catholic circles mm. um, because of the, again the whole machine aspect here. And we're not machines, and this isn't successful all the time. Because it's so expensive, people will will create a number of embryos so they can try multiple times, or implant, or try to implant multiple embryos at once. So it's I not see. uncommon you'll have twins or triplets born. I see. But you also will have maybe all five or six embryos that are implanted at one point in time. You'll have them all actually implant, and they'll start growing and sex tuplets are kind of hard to uh to deal with and so i imagine yeah so i know you have, you have plenty of children well, but imagine all at the same age all at the same, um that is difficult to deal with and so doctors not acting morally we're already mm -hmm. in uh, we'll suggest to, bridges yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll say well let's have a selective reduction of mm -hmm. some of these which is to say various abortions that are happening i see so um yeah, so th there's other issues that come along here too. You need eggs. You need to overstimulate a woman's reproductive system to produce those. So you're introducing a massive amount of hormones. This in and of itself has a notable, um, notable risk of death in certain cases. In Belgium, I believe, or it was Netherlands, I think it was, there have been several deaths as a result of simply giving those kinds of drugs to mm. overstimulate. Um, and then again, it's... We're, we're, we're putting all of these things outside, and then we're putting them back inside. So that's sort of the okay. overarching summary of those kinds of things. Okay, so we actually have several different steps, several Indeed. different moral steps mm -hmm. in, in this broader picture. Of, Indeed. Okay. Yeah. We could say it's also not really, I mean, we're looking at it from the standpoint of infertility here. It's not really a treatment for infertility. Meaning? Were you stepping outside of... Oh, I act. see. You're not actually treating the infertility. Sure. Right. You're, that makes sense. You're you're treating instead. Um, well, you're just getting around it. Like 
I, I, the analogy I used was the uh, was, was driving a car. It's like it, you're not fixing the car. You're just walking down the street. You're taking a completely different means. It's a workaround. It's yeah. not a treatment. Whereas there are actually treatments, even Catholicly, Catholic acceptable treatments that we could look at. Do you want to mention those briefly? Just out of curiosity, I think um, it might be illustrative of uh, some of the principles we've been discussing. And mm -hmm. I do think it's good perhaps to mention that, um, especially from an apologetical perspective, that that's, I mean, again, yes, yes, the church and Catholics are in favor of life. Um, if mm -hmm. certain premises are understood sure. correctly. So may maybe it's worth just mentioning those. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of, I'm sure there, there's more. The, the ones that I know of myself, there's a, a doctor who was at Creighton University and then I, at, a little while later at St. Louis University in St. Louis, mm -hmm. um, who began using um, what what will later be Come the sort of the principles of natural family planning. That's mm. an entirely different subject. We'll yes. save that for some other time. But the um, the idea of charting a woman's cycle as a way of trying to evaluate how she is not conceiving or why she's miscarrying, what the what the difficulties here are in these patterns. So the idea would be that this is charted out for a long time for months, maybe a, a even okay. a year, to get a baseline to then see what needs to happen to treat them. So for instance, maybe, it may, maybe there is polycystic ovarian syndrome, which can be an issue. Maybe it's endometriosis. Mm -hmm. And so now that can be treated because a certain pattern in, in her fertility is seen. That can be treated. And in fact, doing these kinds of things, which are completely moral treatments, not workarounds, okay. um, you can have rates that are exceed IVF in their success. Um, one of the, this is a statistic that NAPRO, which is one of the technologies that, um, okay. that there was developed along these lines, um, they at least suggest um, that they have a, in certain cases with, for instance, polycystic ovarian syndrome, I think it's about an 80% success rate for conception oh, wow. through natural means, through the normal course by just simply treating this, by seeing the problems, by that charting, treating the actual symptoms, the actual disease, they have success. Whereas IVF would have like a 25% or so. Depends on age um, on that too. So there, there are there are Catholic procedures that have been brought up. In fact, the Catholic Church is not against these kinds of things. Sure. So this actually uh, this actually leads us then um, back to the question of how do, how do we apply then the, mm -hmm. the the questions of the natural law? Because you hinted at this already in mm -hmm. using the word natural, for instance. Yeah. I mean, it does seem in some cases the argument the the devil's advocate could say, well, you're ending up with the same. Thing, right, you're ending up with with life. You're ending up with an embryo, mm -hmm. and so uh, we're all good, right? I mean, that's one. Yeah. So if if you decide to, you know, if you decide that that uh, you're you're your sibling, let's say, mm -hmm. I, I use this oftentimes in trying to d describe the difference between choosing something evil, a moral morally evil action, and just something that's evil in the sense that it's not good, right? Not okay. there's no moral character to it. So I, it's a bit dark, but let's say you have a habit of sleepwalking. Okay. Right? You carry your pillow around because, you know, just like, you know, it's like the little blanket that you hold. Sure. And, and as a result, you decide that you, uh, you decide that there's this very nice, comfortable place you're going to lay down. And because of where you put the pillow, you end up smothering a, a sibling or something like that. They're dead. Oh. That's not a good thing. No. 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 But um, it's a little different than if you decided that you hated them and went over and did the same thing, right? Intention and the choice there makes a big difference. So um, that, that flows back into moral principles too. Mm -hmm. When we're choosing to do things that are outside of, that, that aren't outside of the means that we have to an end, we are making a choice, right? That choice yes. can be moral or not moral. Um, so, in the case here of these these principles, we need to um, apologetically we we always have to look at look at the end that we're trying to achieve. Okay. And whether we're trying to choose that end, or whether we're choosing to frustrate that end, um, that's on the natural law side of things. But just because the same effect comes about 
doesn't mean that any means to that effect are good. In the case that I, I showed there before, one means is entirely evil. The other means um, is has no moral character whatsoever to it. It was done without any intention behind it. I see. This is just not to create sure. some new, new horror story that you could, you could you <laughs> produce a new new series of books for Angel's Press on or anything like that. <laughs> Uh, are you are you alluding to or are you talking about the principle of double effect to an extent? Do you want to shed some light well, on that too? Yeah, um, so the, there's that there. Um, I think I'm more alluding to. I'll, I'll get around to double yeah, effect in a second. I think here. that's important to, sure. to clarify. Also, but the um, so the the principles that we're we're operating from here is not just to get the same effect, not the same end, um, because. You know, we can we can always come to the same conclusion, just as we did before. If you think about the the those those who are pro life may come to the same mm -hmm. conclusion on abortion. They may come to it because they think babies are good, or they may come to it because they think all of these other things are immoral. Right? It's the same. You can have different principles. Even in the yes. Catholic world, we have we have difficulties with sort of this more modern approach. It comes to the same moral conclusion on IVF, on abortion, but it comes to the same conclusion from very different principles. And those principles aren't necessarily always good. Thinking of theology of the body and things like that? Things like that. Okay. Yeah, more personalist approach versus okay. the sort of Thomistic, classical, um, classical Catholic morality mm -hmm. approach. Um, with a double effect, yeah, there's a good end. But remember from double effect, another way of thinking about it is indirect voluntary. Some evil is coming about. We don't want the evil. We want the good. We accept to tolerate the evil, and the good can come about. The classic case is um, oftentimes given uh, a, a pilot is supposed to bomb a bridge. Right? Mm -hmm. The enemy is coming across the bridge. If he bombs it, we're safe for a little while, we can regroup, we might win this war. If the enemy comes across with all of his troops, we're done. So he has this duty to do that. He has to, cross, he has to bomb this bridge, but he sees there's children on it. He can't warn them. He tries maybe flying by a few times to ward them off. They're, yay, plane, mm -hmm. something like that. They're, they're not leaving. Does he bomb the bridge or not? Well, he doesn't want the death. He's not trying to cause their death. He, but he can tolerate that evil of their possible death. They might not die either. It's entirely possible. Uh, he can tolerate that, that the good of the salvation of the country, for instance, is, is at the higher good there. But notice what's going on there. There is a good. We're intending the good. We're not taking an evil means towards it. There's an evil side effect, as it were, the casualty here. That's foreseen. Or that's foreseen, least, yeah. and yet it's, you know, we then we can be a bit proportionalistic. We can't do that if if the means are evil. That's the problem with IVF though. So it's not just that it's producing children, it's that it's producing children through evil means, illicit means. There's the problem right there in those illicit means. And no matter what good could come from that, you can't tolerate illicit means. You can tolerate an illicit or an evil effect under certain circumstances. Okay. So even there, it's like, well, we want children, we're sterile. Well, there are means by which we can try to treat that. The, uh, what we talked about there, the, but IVF is not one of those means that is morally acceptable because it separates what we could say the procreative and united aspect, right? It takes procreation, it takes it outside of marriage and then tries to kind of shoehorn it back in, as it were. Um, you can't take the means outside. That's a very good way. Yeah, I see. <clears throat> that's a very good way of putting it. And is that, would you say that's the core issue that, then that is the core issue here okay there's going to be as we mentioned before many extra embryos they're cryopreserved they may die in that process that's bad um there's lots of left leftover ones i think the re most recent count a million or so babies in the deep freeze in, wow. this, in this frozen prison as it were um but we can't even look at that as like oh there's some evil effect here but you know good children right um that's no, we can't take these illicit means. And that's the core issue of the problem with IVF is that it, it takes the, the unitive means that two in one flesh, and mm -hmm. we're not here talking about the marital act. That's, that's one reference point. Yes. But the fruit of that is two in one flesh is husband and wife, mother and father producing child, one flesh that with the one soul will endure for eternity. 
hopefully with the happiness of that child in heaven for all eternity as well. That's, that's the point we're getting at. That's the whole reason for marriage. It's this sacrifice. It's this, it is, there's love involved. That's, mm-hmm. that's, you know, but this love is fruitful. Right? This love is, is, is sacrifice, the image of the church in Christ, is fruitful in the child. But it's through certain means that the contract of marriage makes legitimate. It's through the, the marital act that is, made, that is made legitimate in there for children. Secondarily, lots of other effects. But, okay. But you think about it, I mean, you're wearing a wedding ring. When you made those, that you exchanged those vows, you gave the right over your body to your wife exclusively, entirely for her entirety of your life and her life. You mm-hmm. gave her the right to acts proper to generation, to procreation. And she likewise exchanged an equal right. So now we have an equal contract there. Did at any point in time in your marriage instruction or anything like that, were you told, you gave each other the right to have a child. No. No. Right. No. Right. And so uh, that's the thing. Like, there's no right to have the child. There's the right to the act proper to that. And here we're talking about natural ends, natural means. This is, okay. this is a dicey issue because you hear natural. Immediately, what do you think of the opposite of natural? Artificial. Right. 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 It's, and that's not, we're not opposed to artificial means. Right. right? You go to a fertility clinic or to a doctor, they may give you certain drugs. They may do, give you a certain procedure. And maybe in the case of NAPRO, they, they give you a surgery to remove the cysts from or take the endometriosis out. That will help then the procreation, right? We're not opposed to procreation. We're, not, we're just opposed to procreation outside of this means. We're fine with artificial means to facilitate the marital act and its fruitfulness. We're completely against anything that replaces the marital act. Okay, this is this seems like another big important principle mm-hmm. to have clear. Yeah, the artificial natural right. distinction. Yeah. So um, uh, there, there's an interesting uh, essay, and I think he gave a talk on it with uh, Dr. Fazer, Edward Fazer, yep. about you know who who's right and what's natural. Um, he's talking about natural law here, and it's not just because there's an artificiality; it's that these things flow from the nature of things. Okay. There is your core issue of the natural law and the, the principles that we're trying to draw out here. Okay. You have a natural end, a natural, we have a nature to us. That nature is, to, is for human beings to be a rational animal. We act in a certain way according to that nature, Thomistic principles on that. But then acts that we do have a particular nature to them. The marital act has as its nature procreation. It is, it is naturally oriented towards procreation. This is why, for instance, contraception and various other things that impede this, why self-abuse and, and, and these kinds of things outside of marriage, right? Even in marriage, but things that aren't, that aren't ordered, leading to order yeah. towards procreation. It's the order that's the thing. That's the nature of things that leads to that natural end. That an artificial chemical is used in order to enhance or, uh, the ability for that act to reach its end. We do that all the time. I mean, to drive out here from Kansas City, <laughs> I used a car, right? It's an artificial means, right? And yeah. I, I was able to, there's no immorality in using that artificial means to come out here, right? Just as it, in, in the certain cases, if there's a problem with fertility, you could be treated with a particular procedure or, or, or whatever it is to facilitate the means for that act to reach its end much better. We're not opposed to that. Not okay. at all. That's Catholic a very Church. clarifying principle, I think. It is. I, I, I think that's a really important thing because mm-hmm. we hear natural law, you think artificial, we, we, we can't, can't go to the doctor. Right. I, I can't take vitamins. Right. right. Yeah. They'll, I guess you could say medicine in itself is a yeah artificial way to. In, um, in a lot of cases, I mean, sure. unless, unless we're going to go, I mean, and you think about it, even sort of the naturopathic things, you know, I, I, I know that there's there's a what seems like an olive tree behind us here it might actually be one. We'll see. It's not a real olive tree. Oh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> okay. Well, the we're, analogy we're working on the it. analogy will still work anyway. Okay. Olive leaf is good for, um, for instance, uh, reducing um, reducing blood pressure. Okay. It's, it's sort of a naturopathic treatment sure. for there. But if I can take a chemical, I can take like a beta blocker to reduce blood pressure, or I could have that. I mean, what's the difference? One's produced in a laboratory, one's taken off a tree. One's natural, one's not natural. No, they ha- both have the nature of causing this effect. So I can use either one. It's perfectly yes. fine. 
and they're both kind of artificial. I had to pick the leaf off the tree. I'm not going to do it on this tree. Yeah, but <laughs> I would encourage you not okay. to do that. <laughs> might, might not taste very good. <laughs> but in any case, the, the, the okay, snatch, that's helpful. Yeah. yeah, this natural aspect of things. We're, we're about the nature of things, and the nature of the marital act is procreation. Okay, Procreation outside of that marital act is therefore not moral. It's taking the means and end, it's separating them. And that's that's the core problem here with, with IVF. Okay. Other moral issues that touch on that are, are really important, but they're they're secondary issues really. Okay. Okay, that I think that's all that's all very helpful. Um, and from there, um, I mean, you mentioned uh, several other things that that flow from this. So, uh, if, if we have time, maybe to go through uh, mm-hmm. just some of those, um, like briefly, I, and I think some of these um, the magisterium has weighed in on recently. But like em- embryo adoption, you mentioned oh, er- yeah. earlier, right? I think this is something that um, again in the news, also a relatively new thing. Yeah. That uh, well, the whole the whole situation for the. That, that came up as a result of why sort of everybody's talking about it is right. this Alabama decision yes. in the Supreme Court there. Um, legally, it's an uh, it's an interesting decision. Morally speaking, I don't think anyone ever came out, even the Alabama Supreme Court, and said that this was immoral and it was illegal no. or anything like that. No, no. In fact, the whole case, um, the whole case w- was a civil lawsuit of wrongful death. Yes. It, which is we're not even talking about criminal here. Uh, yes, this, it, there's no there's no issue. There's there's a morality aspect to it, but the and the whole procedure or the whole procedure case. in the court, the case yeah. came about because somebody decided to stupidly reach their hand into some liquid nitrogen. It, it burns like it, <laughs> cold burns just as much as hot here. He he drops the embryos that were frozen there, um, and there's there, a suit for wrongful death. Which is sort of interesting because this, interesting. this ends up setting up the whole question here. Right? This ends up setting up the whole question with regard to what are these embryos, right? Yes. It, it, it's I, Maybe we've gotten put the cart before the horse here, but from a Catholic perspective, we understand that these, these are children, right? The, these are not just a bunch of cells somewhere. It, there's, it's, it would be sort of an arbitrary cutoff point otherwise in, in, sure. in summer there. But the, if these are children they they have a right to life they're human beings right and and we would say that i think maybe it's helpful to to anticipate some objections or clarifications here mm-hmm. um we would say that because at that's the point at which um assuming everything uh, proceeds according to, to a plan they're going to inevitably or should inevitably reach their end as a, as, as a fully formed well human. we can do that so one of the and i know it's sort of a it's a bit of a, a trope you'll you may hear from some more conservative ones who want to be want to speak against abortion, mm-hmm. but they don't really want to may absolutely define a line at conception right. as as the beginning of life. Right. They'll say, well, it's a potential human being, and you can't stop that whole steps. And that's that's a fairly good argument, but but in fact, because if an embryo is a human being, then we have a problem with anything that's going to go on for there's there's a whole lot of moral issues that come up sure if it's not there certainly could be situations in which you know if it's just a bunch of cells maybe there might be moral circumstances in which you could harvest some of those cells you could use mm-hmm. them for certain things maybe okay it's you you could there there might be certain aspects of things here in which you could do that um but but the the problem with the sort of is going to touch on when the soul comes in to a yeah. degree but we can already see an embryo. So, okay, let's back up here. Um, get, a, get a little philosophical. Sorry. <laughs> let's do it. Okay. <laughs> um, we are a composite. We get into hylomorphism yes. if you wanted to a little bit here. But uh, we're a composite of body and soul. Um, on, from an Aristotelian to mystic standpoint, we have a form and matter. Mm-hmm. Body is matter. Form is our soul. Okay, the form of something gives it its nature. It's because we mm-hmm. have this soul that we are a human being, right? If we didn't have a soul, we wouldn't be a human being. We could mm-hmm. be a lot of other things. Yes. You, can, you could be a Frankenstein, you could animate a corpse, something like that. If it doesn't have a human soul, it's not a human being. It might have a human body, but it's not a human being. And that's where the issue comes up with, with these embryos. Are they just human bodies or are they human beings? Well, okay, we have this form, we have this soul. The soul part of us, we have a rational nature. 
meaning yes. we can reason. This is where, if you look at it in Genesis, we're talking about the image and likeness of God. The, the image is our rational nature, right? The likeness is then the supernatural life of grace. Yes. Not the main subject of what we're talking about here. Um, and that doesn't even exist, if you think about it, until baptism anyway. Right. So we're, we're not baptizing little, little embryos in, a, in the cryogenic chain or the, the water will freeze in too much time there. So. Okay. Um, but of our, our, this image of God, the image is our rational nature by which we have an intellect and a will. We can know, we can love, though the proper operations of those. The reason that we know that a human embryo is a person is that it has that potential one day to exercise those functions. And those functions don't just randomly show up at some point in time. At what point in time can we define that the faculty exists? We know the use begins at a point in time, but in order to have the use of a faculty, you have to have the faculty sure. itself, right? And that faculty, that's what, that's what ends up helping us define what a person is here. It's this distinct being subsisting in an intellectual nature. That's St. Thomas's definition of yes. it. Which is to say, we have, we have this independent being with this nature to it. The nature that we can see in the faculty of knowing and loving, of intellect and will, that will come about at some point in time. And this is the difference between the use of the faculty. Um, a child can't begin to use a faculty if he didn't have it to begin with, as we said before. Right. So. When does the soul come into the embryo? The church hasn't defined that, but we it's at least the safest course, if not more of a sort of moral certainty, that we treat the embryo, even just immediately after conception, as the individual human being that it is, and treat it with these rights, give it the, give it the, the, the treatment as if we would any other child. Okay. That then gets into the issue with regard to all of these extra kids in, in the deep freeze, right? What are we doing with them, right? Yeah. Their From a Catholic perspective, how do you, if there's a million, I think you said earlier, a million, possibly a million mm -hmm. or more um, uh, embryos and, yes, what do we do? And, and they're humans. Yeah. What What is well, the Catholic answer to that? First, don't create them. Sure. <laughs> sure. But practically in the here and now. Right. Um, yeah. What is... I don't think there's a really good solution. Certainly okay. the, C the CDF, the, well, now DDF. Yes. But before the, the congregation formerly known as a dicastery, formerly known as mm -hmm. the CDF, um, back when they were discussing this issue, they even admitted that there doesn't seem to be a moral solution to this uh. problem. It's not as much the issue with IVF, of course, the conception outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, that's immoral. We we, we, we we established that there, but now what do you do? Yeah, that's a great question. Because you've al you've already also established that the you know, yeah, surrogacy or you know that that's not a, a moral option. It's so not a moral option, uh, right? Yeah. So with surrogacy, even on even outside of there, and that's that's sort of big in the news, even in conservative circles. Yes. But the surrogacy issue is is even a bigger one because you have you have a woman who's carrying a, a child to term either who has been conceived through adultery or mm -hmm. who has been conceived through IVF and then implanted into a third person's womb. Either way, this, this, it doesn't, in IVF, it disturbs the, the primary end of marriage mm -hmm. and uh, the adulterous relationship to produce this child. It, it not only attacks the, the primary end of the, of the marriage, it attacks secondary ends as well. I mean, the unitive aspect sure. of the, the mutual love of spouses is kind of going to be thrown off by that. Yes. And then you throw this third person into the marriage who, you know, at least did something for the child's life. There's, there's a problem there. Yeah. Um, but that surrogacy issue is, um, yeah, that, that's, that's a problem. But this is where you get the double effect again, right? Okay. Can we tolerate the evil of surrogacy or can we tolerate... I mean, it's it's a goodwill. It's it's sure. right uh, intention. Right? right. What's the problem with attention, though, for morality? It's it's only the third thing you consider. Right? We talk moral object, mm -hmm. then circumstances, and then we look at the intention. A good intention doesn't vitiate evil moral object, right? Yes. Sure. 
right? That person may be feeling terrible because they've been, they've been wronged by their husband. My intention to make them happy doesn't justify shooting their husband for them, right? Right. It, it, we, we, can't, we, can't, we, we can't forget that moral object. The, the nature of the act, the nature of what we're doing is, gives the first sort of character to what's going on. Then intentions come in later. The good intention to raise this child to give this child life is notable, laudable. And I don't think, and most people who would be doing this have very good intentions. Yes, and, for sure. And the intentions there may, if they're not really informed about this, may actually save them from having committed some kind of grave sin, right? You need to, in order to commit some kind of sin, you need to have a knowledge of something. And you also have to be able to then will that thing, knowing it's evil. You, you don't just get to, um, you don't just do something bad. There's, there's another distinction. We, we, we Catholics tend to get wrong sometimes. Like, okay. Bad thing happens, therefore it was sin. I feel mm. bad about something, and therefore yes. I committed a sin. No, no. Sin is a bad choice. Okay? You made a choice that you knew to be wrong, or you should have known to be wrong. Yes. Very, very important distinction there. In the confessional, I can tell you how many times, but Father, I feel so bad about this thing or the other thing. I know you feel bad about it. It's probably good to feel bad about that a little bit. But um, no, it's that, it's that choice. So maybe some of these people who are trying to adopt these embryos, there, there's whole organizations now to do this. Um, maybe they're trying to do a good thing. Maybe they, okay. maybe they have a good intention. But again, we're back to those, what principles are they operating from? Are they operating simply from the emotional principle of it's good to, it, it's good to give this person the chance at life? Mm -hmm. Indeed it is. But it has to be subjected to those moral principles that we were trying to outline before. Right? This child can't just be put into somebody's womb. Uh, the, the church hasn't actually decided the full moral question here, but it, okay. So there's no there's no solid basis on me to say, well, that Pope decided sure. that or this that. Okay. But but we're in a we're in a, a situation of certainly a a possible seriously morally uh, morally bad problem. Well, that's we're maybe the best way to put it. Yeah, we're in a brave new world. Oh, where, sure. Where the yeah, the, there are you know, Huxley, maybe even Huxley not, could not have even <laughs> begun to. No, and yeah. so uh, and maybe you want to speak a little bit about that as well because. Um, you know, for the most part, I think we we have talked so far about, um, let's say, the the putatively good willed uh, person who's looking at this technology yeah. with again lack of clarity in the principles. Mm -hmm. But but if you yeah again go back to the thirty thousand foot or you zoom out and you look at how this technology is used mainly in the world and the industry mm -hmm. as such, um, you also get a different picture about what's going on and what's at stake so industry is a very very good world word to use there okay well and there yeah maybe you could speak about that because this gets into eugenics this gets into a lot of unsavory things yeah. um beyond the the limited cases yeah. you've discussed so far no. and so the case we're discussing so far we're looking at it from okay <clears throat> infertile couple who who wants something right good Right. Well, and, and this is where it's very easy to get confused. Like I said with the governor before in Texas, like we want like, babies. Sure, we're, sure. we're in favor of babies. We like babies. Sure. On like, its surface, it looks like a good e argument. Exactly. Yeah. And that's why we have to go to the moral principles. But yeah, these people are operating from what seem to be at least emotionally supportive principles. Sure. And okay. Good intentions. Good intentions. And yeah, I mean, it's a struggle. I mean, scripture itself talks about how having children and having a, you know, it, it's it's a it's a good, it's a blessing, it's yes. a great thing, and not, of course, then a sterility is not a good thing. Sure. And so, of course, it's there's an emotional problem there, but yeah, zoom out beyond the sort of the the, the emotionalism, zoom out beyond even the principles. Look, you know, maybe focus a little bit more to the left and look down, and we have, I mean. I, I, I remember a talk that I was listening to here where, where the, uh, the speaker on this said that the problem was capitalism. Like, mm. like wait, 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 what? <laughs> <laughs> problem was cap it, It's that there is this market there, right? Catholic principles are great and moral principles and natural law because they actually limit us, right? They, they focus us down on what is legitimate, what's able to be done without, you know, without stepping over moral lines. But if you zoom out and then you look over there, 
it's easy if you don't have these moral principles to create an actual industry. Uh, the fertility industry, I believe, worldwide is about eight billion dollars. Okay. Which, granted, in the in the case of you know, budgets and things like that these days, with with various countries, is is chump change, really. But yeah. But it's not nothing. And and with a with an IVF treatment running somewhere upwards of perhaps even thirty thousand dollars. Okay. Add a surrogate in there, and you're in the hundreds of thousands of dollars range. Okay. Um, there is a lot of money to be made from this, and perhaps one of the reasons why some of the more successful morally acceptable treatments aren't used or aren't recommended oftentimes by these fertility clinics is we have a quick and easy way to make money and to mm. perhaps get this end. And it doesn't even have to be nefarious along those lines. It's just, well, this is the easy way of doing things. Okay. I'll give you an example. Uh, another another uh, interview with a doctor that I was listening to a while back preparing for this. Um, she She mentions that if a woman has endometriosis, which is a, a uterine condition, sometimes will, which will help to, um, or which will cause a, a difficulty for conception or a difficulty in carrying the child, um, endometriosis oftentimes it takes upwards of seven years to make a proper diagnosis of this, uh. and the reason being is because if a woman goes to her gynecologist, she says. I'm in a lot of pain. What can you do for me? They give contraceptive pills. It's uh, just the standard treatment. Okay. And that ends up, well, stop, stopping the natural cycle. So now there's not this problem anymore. There's not this bleeding. There's not this irritation. Maybe it's, or at least it's calmed down a lot. And so it seems like it's all been treated. We've not actually cured the disease. We've treated the symptom. Mm. And so now it takes so much longer for the symptom to be treated. It's an easy, you know, it's it's, sure. it's a cheap means mm -hmm. out of the office. You got the you know good copays done, and it doesn't have to be nefarious in it, in its intentions either. It's hey, we solved the problem really quickly. I see. We didn't actually solve the problem. It's it's not a treatment. Yeah. Again, it it it, it goes around the actual treating of the disease, and that's where in these more in the, the Napro chart that yeah okay for a few months somebody may be in pain painkillers various other things but you start to see oh hey this pattern looks more like this I we see. can now go in and actually treat that and now we don't even need ivf to help perhaps i see so it, why why would you do this from from a from the thirty thousand foot view it's the cheaper easy way of doing it you don't need to assume bad intentions for that just it just the sort of natural process of of going in the doctor needing to get you yeah, pushed out sense. and go through right but it certainly can have those nefarious characteristics yeah i mean yeah it's big money once big money enters the picture it can be it, it, there can be a lot of that there one of that statistic i mentioned before 41 percent from the cdc the 41 percent of those who are undergoing ivf are for banking the embryos so hopefully mm. maybe later they can have children right right it's not to treat infertility at all it's simply because they don't want children now they want them later and so they'll save a few in the in the deep freeze in case they want some later maybe they don't want them maybe they do there's a lot of industry in that add to it a lot of genetic testing because you don't want to implant embryos that are i see that are not viable or that perhaps don't have the characteristics you'd like for them i see yeah so it is it is eugenic to an extent Indeed. right for a lot of a lot of people it and, is and in you know it took a little while but now we can very clearly identify a, a male sperm and a female sperm and choose the choose the, the the sex of the child we if we can do that i don't think it's too far off to start thinking that we could genetically edit some of these features beforehand you know um maybe it's it could be happening now I mean, I, yeah not, not advertised as such but um you know throw in some CRISPR technology and you could very easily get some, yeah, brave new world type stuff going on where it's designer babies chosen, you know, selected from a catalog. Already that's done. Um, back in the, the, back in one of the elections before, I think it was 2012, there, the, the, um, Mitt Romney, the Republican candidate, yes. was criticized because he wanted to appoint women to certain offices. Yes. And the sort of thing is he had binders full of women, 
you know, and the ones that he could choose. And he was roundly criticized for that. But literally, you go into some of these clinics, and if you're tr trying to choose the surrogate or you're trying to get an egg donation because the woman, your wife, is infertile, you literally look through binders of women to choose the characteristics for the child that you want to conceive. I mean, that that is eugenics. Yeah. I mean, Margaret Sanger would be thrilled yeah. with this idea, and and many others. Many others in the world who have had more eugenic ideas to make sure certain traits are selected for and not. It is literally artificial selection. Yeah, that's frightening. It is. Yeah. yeah. And, and the technology is just, it is outpacing the, the ethics behind it. You see that okay. thing? So, um, what was it? Uh, I'm, I'm remembering, this is going to date me a little bit. But I, I know you've probably seen it as well. Um, Jurassic Park? Yes. Okay. Um, Dr. Ian Malcolm. One of my, yes. Uh, my my, uh, my name, uh, namesake there. Um, chaos Theory. I also have the math background too, so it's kind of fun. Um, there's this interesting discussion that they're having at table um, before they go out in the little adventure that they have during, sure. the, during the movie. Unfortunately, it's not in the book. And Michael Crichton, it would be just so great if he had included this line. But in the, in the, in the screenplay, uh, he says something along the lines of, your, your scientists were so obsessed with the fact that they could that they never stop to think whether they should or not. Mm. You've been doing a series with Father Kopeck. I know he's been yes. warming this seat for me, and now I'm warming it for him for the next time <laughs> around. Um, but in that, you've been talking about technology, right? Yes. Part of the difficulty with this technology is it's outpacing our ability to see its effects. Right now, you're starting to have studies. You're starting to have people outside of Catholic circles, outside of Christian circles. Mm -hmm. I mean, even people who've worked for Google talk about the difficulties in in processing these things well and dealing with them well and the danger they're in. It's the same kind of technology thing here where we, we've outpaced the ability to go back and actually analyze this morally before we do the next step. And the Catholic Church is actually really good about setting these prudent limits. There's the apologetic for you. If you think yeah, no, I think I think you should uh, you should give us the apologetic here too. <laughs> I guess um, I'm drawing out from the apologetic series then. So. Yes. Um, so the 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 church is the church is actually favors science. I mean, despite what you what you may hear from various sure. circles, um, the church is actually very pro science. I, I'm a, I'm a priest. I'm a Catholic because I, I because I've seen this, and mm -hmm. that was one of the most interesting things to look at is to see how the Catholic Church is what is, is really the patroness of science, a good of good science, properly and, defined. Yes, yes, properly defined good science, right? Um, because one of the one of the difficulties is that the Church herself wants to restrict us. Wants to. It's the. Um, the but you mean that in a good way. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Maturity is about restricting ourselves, right? You, you, we, <laughs> uh, we, we, we've, we've had a, a, a number of years of, of, of knowing each other. These, yes. And, a, um, and we were younger once. And before you were married and you were, you were courting your wife, you moved to Kansas City. We, we, we had some adventures and things like that. Nothing sinful. Don't worry. <laughs> um, but... Um, yeah, at that point in time, you weren't married. You hadn't yet chosen sure. more certainly that this would be your job. This would be the role that you played. You you hadn't limited yourself so much. You had the the whole world ahead of you. Sure, um, but you know sometimes we need to make choices, and those choices will affect a lot of things going down the road. We we have to. Maturity is about limiting ourselves down, focusing. Right. Right. I want to be very clear that yeah, for everyone that. Um, limiting oneself restricting oneself is uh it's part of the um the proper path towards yeah. um the good yeah it, it, it is a good it is unlimited choice is not a good no <laughs> philosophically it, it's it's an absolute <laughs> right. it's an absolute fail there too right <laughs> we are told to be perfect as our heavenly father is perfect uh philosophically god is perfectly in act he is pure act Endless possibility is pure potential. It's the exact opposite of that. And if we're called to be perfect, we're getting more actual 
as our life progresses, mm-hmm. which means we're we're narrowing down. Yes, okay, we're getting more specific. Like adding an adjective to a noun makes something more specific. Yes. It makes it a bigger picture of that thing, but it also restricts it, right? This is a um, this is an a coffee cup that is my coffee cup, right? <laughs> Not yours, it's mine. True. So I've restricted it from all the group of coffee cups, right? To the ones that belong to me. I have others. I have a lot sure. of coffee cups. But, sure. Um, so that, that, that restriction there is actually helping us to, to become better. Philosophically, it's making us more in act, making us more perfect. It applies just as much to science. Right, mm. we restrict things to where the where where the morality allows us to work. Not only then preserving us from sin, that's yes. that's a good thing. Yes, but it also helps. The church is basically saying, from the principles God has given us, this this little area here, search there, the answers there. And we're we're so oftentimes looking over here because we found this new idea over here. It's like, no, 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 no. Look here. Sure. Look here. The treasure is hidden over here. Yeah. Don't 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 waste your time over there. That's and and it actually sort of bears it out too. Um, we we have we we have related to IVF stem cells. That was a big thing a number of years back. Yeah. Um, we won't go into all of those kinds of things. We're harvesting cells from these embryos actually another but you can harvest them as well is it just it's not just embryonic uh no there's a a question yeah there's adult ones too Sure, but there's a big thing about embryonic stem cells because these cells are pluripotent meaning they can turn into all or omnipotent okay not in the sense of all powerful but they can turn into any cell in the human body you think about it it starts with one cell right Mm. that has to be able to turn into anything Skin cell, sure. heart cell, muscle, I see. nerve. I see. Whatever. It has to be able to turn into anything. In the adults, it's more limited. Okay. Right? Your skin stem cells can turn into skin cells. A variety of different kinds of skin cells. Okay. But skin cells. Kidney stem cells. So you're much more limited in okay. those. They're not pluripotent. Um, but there was that big thing about stem cells. And despite all of that talk for a long time about embryonic stem cells and their potentials, how many therapies do you think we've now approved in the United States for treatment? I don't know. Well, that's because there's none. Okay. Yeah, there's zero. Okay, I do absolutely know. accidentally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely zero approved treatments using embryonic stem cells. Okay. Wow. But we have uh, treatments using adult stem cells, which the church has no problem with using. One of the most common ones is one of the oldest ones, bone marrow transplants. Like if you have cancer and you, uh, you uh, for instance, um, you know, blood cancers, mm-hmm. various things along those lines, you will get a bone marrow transplant, right? That's, that's a stem cell treatment. You're taking the stem cells from your bones that produce the blood cells and you're putting them into your bones that hopefully they start producing those cells and non-cancerous versions of them. So we, we have that. There, there's a... There's an article in uh, the the journal Current Biology a couple of years ago, about okay. three three or so. Um, the the let's see if I can see if I can get the quote right here. Um, the the gentleman who's writing the ar- article says four decades after the first preparation of embryonic stem cells, um, this early hope for regenerative medicine has failed to convert into any real world applications. Mm. So basically. We, we've had four decades, 40 years worth of this research that the church has says is immoral. It said, don't look over there. There's no answers over there. Those are all immoral answers and you're sinning and you're doing all these other things too. Look over here, here's the answer. Mm. And what have we found in 40 years? There's no answer over here. That, that answer is wrong. That it, it, You shouldn't have looked there. We wasted our time. Interesting. And think of it that way. How much time have we wasted by all of these immoral means from actual, real, useful scientific developments? Yeah, that's very interesting. I suppose, and this this maybe gets back to, um, and maybe um, maybe I can ask you to actually sum up the, the moral things here in a minute. But mm-hmm. it, it gets back to the the kind of apparent objection, which is um, the reason that this this something is perceived as good when it's not is because of the confusion of means and ends mm-hmm. and, and what it takes for a whole we, act to be moral. Yeah. Right. 
Um, right. th there's there's that. There's also our modern attitude towards the absolute freedom, the absolute autonomy, absolute efficiency, um, gratification. Mm -hmm. Again, this is back to that act and potency thing. These are all potentials, and we're supposed to actualize these things by restricting ourselves. So um, a lot of those problems end up from that that spirit that we've created in ourselves, this you know rugged individualism, sure. of, of especially of us Americans who are mm -hmm. overly practical people, um, leave our country as I did for a number of years, and you find people who are not so overly practical, sure. sometimes idealistic. Um, but but that's a contemporary disorder that we really have this 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 chaos where moral value and objective reality isn't the thing we seek after and that's why we start going on emotions babies are good you know so ivf is fine so uh, well the stem cells could do many things so we just mm -hmm. go after them and like so we we have to go back to those principles we have to go back to this idea of things are for a particular mm -hmm. purpose and we cannot frustrate that purpose. And frustration is a very good, w I think, you, word to use in that. Okay. Because th there, there you go, right? The end might not be achieved, right? Um, y you know I like to cook, but sometimes, yes. sometimes yep. I burn things. Sure. Right? The end of a nutritious meal w w was achieved, and then I overdid it a bit. So it wasn't achieved in the end. But it doesn't mean that I wasn't trying to cook, right? Right. The same thing with, 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 with the marital relations. Sometimes children happen. In fact, the vast majority of times, they, a child doesn't result. Mm -hmm. In fact, what, what happens if you have marital relations during pregnancy? Is that immoral? No, we're not trying to frustrate the end. We're, we're using the means that are legitimate, that are ordered towards that end. And so it's perfectly legitimate, as long as it's not causing some other problem mm -hmm. there. So um, those are the principles and the, the difficulty is, is if we don't keep those, we just become completely subjective. We end up, we end up with with different principles, and somehow sometimes the same conclusions. But those are accidental. But accidentally, accidentally, mm. yeah, yeah, act completely accidentally. Whereas if we look at the nature of things, and the church helps us to do that by her definitions. She's, she's not coming down in the sense of defining some new moral re re revelation. Yeah, and these are not arbitrary. Yeah. Well, Bishop right. Sheen I, I talked about if, if people ended up st stuffing up their ears and blinding themselves and going, going around, the church would tell, tell you not to do that, right? <laughs> you wouldn't be able to hear or see what she sure. said. But, but it's, it's not because, because you're supposed to be able to see. The eye is for seeing. The ear is for hearing. Yeah, certain times... You don't hear something, too much noise, various other things going on, but the ear is for hearing. The eye is for seeing. If you blinded yourself because you don't like what you see, you've done something immoral, right? You've frustrated the end of that thing. All we're talking about here is that the end of marriage is procreation. And so you can't see without eyes, you can't hear without ears, you can't have a child, well you can, not morally, right. you can't have a child without normal natural marriage relations within marriage for it to be moral and that says nothing about the goodness of that child sure of course right uh there are cases of children who are conceived in rape do we decide to kill them afterward because they're they're somehow bad no they're in they're they're good but we don't encourage rape in order to have children sure right so we we have to see the the child is good and we want children. We want babies, mm -hmm. to quote the governor again there. Right. But we don't want babies by any means possible. We want babies through the means God has given us, nature has provided us to achieve that end, outside of which there aren't moral. Is it too bold to say, um, and this maybe cuts against some, of, against some of the emotionalism and against some of the less than ideal arguments of, of the modern world, but um, I mean, life is not an unqualified good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a hard thing to say, but it's a it's a true statement. It is. Yeah, uh, life is not an unqualified good. Sometimes it's better that life be given up for. What does Caiaphas say? As we're, we're approaching the uh, Lenten end of our Lenten time, uh, it, it is good that one die for the people. Right? By the way, and sort of a side note here, gift of prophecy according to Scripture didn't help him all that much. <laughs> the charismatic gifts and all those things, you know, that we, we do all these things we want. No, no, no. Yeah, they're, they're, not, they're not necessarily for us. But it's an entirely true statement. If our Lord hadn't gone to the cross, 
then the God's honor would not have been restored and we would not be in the position we're in. To have the guidance of the church that he's given us to help us to, to reach the end for which we're made, which is heaven. Father, I can't thank you enough. Thank you for helping us stay principled on this, especially on this very uh, delicate topic. And um, hope to have you back soon for other podcasts. Yeah. We'll, we'll see about that in the future, but I hope so too. Thanks, Father. All right. God bless. God bless. Thanks for listening to this episode of Questions with Father on the SSPX podcast and on our YouTube page. Please consider subscribing to the YouTube account and to the podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever fine podcasts are found. And please consider leaving a rating or a review on the podcast. This will make sure that more people can find these episodes and discover the beauty and the truth of traditional Catholicism. Until next time, thank you for joining us and God bless you.